And uh, when I was in elementary school, one of our favorite times of the year was when they would gather us into the gym, all us all students into the gym, and we watch a movie. Popcorn, the smell of popcorn would fill the air, and, and the anticipation of what movie they were going to show would grow, and we were all excited. Well, there was one movie every year about this time of year they would show. How many of you have ever seen the greatest Christmas pageant ever? Any, any, anybody out there? One, two, three, a few of you? Yeah, okay, some in the balcony. Love that movie. It was like one of my favorite movies as a kid. I don't know why. It was just, it was funny. It was funny. It was fun. It was real. Uh, but that was the movie we could count on every year. That was the movie that they would show in our school gymnasium uh, at Heminger Elementary School in Kenmore. Loved it. Uh, if you don't know about the movie, it's a story about uh, this rough and tough group of kids called the Herdmans. They were, they were brothers and sisters. And um, the Herdmans had never stepped foot in church, never been in church until one of the Herdman boys, the oldest Herdman boy, uh, overheard some kids talking about free food being served in Sunday school. And so these kids showed up the next, very next Sunday for the free food, of course, and they find out that rehearsals are going on for the, for the Christmas pageant. And so they're going to try out. These mean and tough and streetwise kids had never even heard the story of the birth of Jesus Christ. They had never even heard the Christmas story. But they tried out for, for the parts, and they got all the lead roles because the other kids in the church were afraid of them. That's how mean and tough these kids were. So these kids who never heard the Christmas story get, get all the main parts in the story. And um, Leroy Herdman, who was kind of deemed as, as a slow kid, um, he, he got the part of the innkeeper. He had one line. His line was, I'm sorry, we have no room. But he just couldn't get it right. Every rehearsal, he, he practiced it over and over again at home. He just couldn't get this line down. And um, on the night of the pageant, things got real interesting for Leroy. See, for Leroy, this was no longer just a play. In his mind, everything became real. So his brother and sister, who were playing the parts of Mary and Joseph, as they were coming down the aisle, became really Mary and Joseph in Leroy's mind. This be they became the real carpenter with a young, pregnant, teenage uh, uh, engagement there. And, and, and Mary and Joseph show up to Leroy's real inn, and they're looking for a real room. And so Leroy, when it came time to deliver his only line, he got it right. And like, wow, you know, I can't believe it. I'm sorry, we have no room. But then he inserted his own ad-lib line, and he said, but you can stay in my room. Now, of course, the adults in the, in, the, in the audience, they thought he had gotten it all wrong. Uh, they thought he ruined the play, that he totally missed the point. But Leroy's ad-libbed line, I think, makes this the greatest Christmas pageant ever. Because I think Leroy understood just how important Jesus is in our lives, in his life, in everybody's life. Uh, we know that on that silent night some 2,000 years ago, we know there was, there was no room for Mary and Joseph. There was no room for Jesus that night in the inn. In Luke chapter 2, we read, while they were there, Mary and Joseph were there, uh, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Each time I, I watch a reenactment of, of the uh, birth of Christ, of the Christmas story, I kind of get a little ticked off at the innkeeper. How about you? I mean, what a jerk. He couldn't find just a little bit of room for these, this young couple. She's pregnant and, you know, about ready to pop. And, and he can't find a room for this young couple. And if he only knew the significance of the couple standing before him, trying to find a place where the Savior of the world could be born, you know, but the innkeeper missed it. He totally missed it. Now, unlike the innkeeper, we get it. We know how important this moment is. 
We know what Jesus has done. We know who Jesus is. We know the significance that he brings to our lives. Yet, just like the innkeeper, I think we miss it sometimes. Don't we? We miss it sometimes, who this really is. We go through life, we're running here and there and getting this and that done, and, and, and from time to time we leave no room for Jesus Christ. We leave no room. He becomes a second thought. Why is that? Why is it difficult sometimes to uh, give Jesus the room that he deserves? That's what I want to look at this morning. There there are four reasons I'm going to give you. And if we can see these four signs in our lives, then perhaps uh, we can clear these rooms out and leave Jesus some room. And our lives can be transformed into something beautiful, into something meaningful, and something significant in this world. And then God can prepare for us a room in heaven. We clean out our rooms. He gives us a room in heaven. I think that's pretty neat. How do we leave no room for Jesus in our lives? Number one, this is one way we we fail to give Jesus room in our lives. We compartmentalize our lives. Write that in your notes. We compartmentalize. We have this tendency to compartmentalize or compartmentalizing our lives. And there may be nothing wrong with that on the surface. I'm pretty good at doing this with my own life. Um, By compartmentalizing my life, I can get things done. I can get through my days a little easier. In other words, I can, I, I can go to work and I can behave professionally and I can get my tasks done. And then I can come home and there's, that's another compartment and I can be a husband and I can be a dad or I can just be me. Or in my hobbies, in that compartment of my life, I can escape the pressures of everyday life and I can just go out and swing a golf club or do whatever I like to do in, in my hobbies and just live and be in that moment. You see, it, it's in these um, compartments that we gain identity, right? Uh, we establish identities in these compartments in our lives. Some of you are students. That's your identity. You're students in school. Some of you are nurses. That's your identity at work. Some of you are uh, moms and dads at home. Some of you are members of a club. That's your identity. And so we compartmentalize these different areas of our lives all to give us identity and, and that kind of thing. We gain these identities in each and every compartment in our lives. And then we read something in the Bible and we go, oh man, I hope I haven't missed my identity. Jesus uh, instructs John to write in, to the church in Ephesus in, in, in this warning in Revelation chapter 2. Yeah, we're going to go to Revelation this morning. Isn't that cool? On Christmas. Uh, John writes this, or Jesus says this to the church. He says, I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. You have forsaken your first love. Remember what it was like to be in love? Do you remember when you fell in love? What a great day. What a great time. I can remember it very well. It was a spring semester. Hi, honey. Spring semester of 1995 at Kentucky Christian University. And I'd fallen pretty hard. I I wanted to spend every moment I could with this special lady in my life. You know, classes were too long. And the days were too short. Just not enough time. As soon as our last class ended for the day, Dawn and I would meet up and and we would... uh, Hold hands, walking around campus, you know. The birds were singing, love was in the air, it was so great, you know. <laughs> we would uh, maybe hang out in the Red Lounge. If you go to KCC, you know where the Red Lounge is. Actually, it's probably not there anymore. They tore that building down. We'd hang out in the Red Lounge or maybe go, to, go for a drive to uh, Grayson Lake and just hang out at the lake for the rest of the day. But here's the deal. I wanted to know everything about this lady that was in my life. And so we spent as much time as we could together. When curfew ended at 11 o'clock at night, we would go back to our dorms, and guess what we would do? Right on the phone and talk till, you know, 2 and 3 in the morning. And I got to say, it's amazing we even graduated college. I mean, it was crazy. Um, But I couldn't imagine spending this kind of time with any other person in my life just wasn't going to happen. So in the spring of 1996, I got down on one knee at Grayson Lake and I asked her to marry me. No way I'd let this one go. It was a great day. And you know, here's the cool thing. This is the kind of relationship that God wants us to have with Him, if you think about it. He wants us to be in a place with Him where nothing else matters, where 
Nothing else is more important. And nothing else gets in the way and gets in His way in acting in our lives. And I wonder if we've compartmentalized our lives so much that many of us have kind of left Jesus to some hidden room in the back, some back closet, some stable out back. And I wonder if sometimes the only time that we go to visit that room is right here on Sunday morning, this one hour of worship. We go to that room, we visit for a little while, and then we walk out, we close the door, and and we keep Jesus kind of in that back closet. We compartmentalize that. Have we forsaken our first love? Have we forsaken our first love? I wonder what it would look like if we opened the doors for Jesus to the other compartments in our lives. What, would, what, if, what if Jesus went to work with us? What if Jesus lived in our houses, in our homes with us? What if Jesus went out onto the golf course with us? Or whatever you like to do, shopping and that kind of thing. What if Jesus went with us everywhere we went? What would that look like? And I think in, a, in an attempt to prioritize uh, uh, their lives, people say something like this. Well, in my life, it's, it's Jesus first, family second, my job third, and whatever else after that. And that's okay. But I think we run the danger of, of again, compartmentalizing our lives. You know, again, when I'm when, if Jesus is first, then I'm going to be at church. And if my family is second, well, then I'm going to be with my family. And if my job is third, well, then I'm going to... Again, we're kind of compartmentalized. I say, what if it looked like this? What if we put Jesus at the center of our lives, and then everything that we did in our life revolved around Him? What would that look like? So if Jesus is the center of my life, then when I'm on my computer, Jesus is there. When I'm at work, Jesus is there. He's the center of my life, and it's revolving around Him. When I'm at school, when I'm wherever, Jesus is at the center of my life, and He has full access to what's going on and what I'm doing in my life. What would that look like? Instead of compartmentalizing and leaving Jesus out of these things, what if I actually pulled Him in and let Him be a part of it? Someone once quipped, If Jesus is not Lord of all then He's not Lord at all. If Jesus is not Lord of all in your life, then He's not Lord at all. And that's pretty scary. I'd rather have all of Jesus than none. Here's the second sign of leaving no room for Jesus in our lives. Write this in your notes. Clutter. I have a secret obsession. I like to watch the show... Hoarding buried alive. <laughs> Any fans out there? Come on, be honest. Yeah, I love that show. Uh, and, and if you don't know what it is, every show features uh, people who have buried themselves in their own homes in their clutter, stuff everywhere. Usually, uh, because of some mental disorder or something going on in their lives, some kind of depression or that kind of thing, these people have a, have this need to keep everything. They purchase from memorabilia to souvenirs to clothing to food. Even their own waste and garbage ends up piling up in their houses. And, of course, the camera crew shows up, and they go through the house, and they show you scenes from each and every room. And uh, some houses, you know, they have these narrow walkways, and there's piles of stuff on, on every side of them as they're walking. These, some houses are so full that people actually have to walk over the piles of clutter, head, I mean, and having to crouch because the ceiling's right here. Um, and, and I just think it's amazing. Some homes are bug-infested because of the food and junk and garbage that's laying around. And, and, and just about every episode, as my family and I are watching the show, we end up shrieking in terror because of how disgusting sometimes these people's homes are. You know, we're just like, whoa, dude, I, I can't imagine what that would be like. And, and so... I. As I was watching the show this past Monday night, I started thinking about, you know, what about our spiritual lives? What about our spiritual lives? How much clutter do we have in the rooms of our hearts sometimes, which kind of crowd out Jesus? We don't leave room for Him. 
Aside from working 40 hours a week, you know, we're running here and there. We're taking the kids to soccer practice. We're working out at the gym every day. We're blogging on the internet. We're keeping up on Facebook. We're crushing candy. And, we're, man, we're getting it done, you know. And, and we're making sure we're not missing our favorite TV shows. And, you know, it's the Christmas season, so we've got all this stuff to do. We've got shopping to do and pies to bake and parties to attend and decorations to hang. And, we got, and our, we're running here and there and there. And all of a sudden, we've got all this clutter in our lives. And where's Jesus? Totally forgotten about. And you know, we're so technologically advanced today. I think it's great, you know. I I love these time-saving devices. We all have them, you know. In the time it used to take to bake a meal in your oven, we've got microwaves now. I love that. Why? Because I can quickly cook my meal and get back in in front of the TV and watch my favorite shows, right? We've got, uh, uh, in the time it used to take to write out a letter, and put it in an envelope, and remember licking a stamp? <laughs> remember those days when you had to actually stamp to get it to stick? Licking a stamp, putting it in an envelope, and running down to the post office. And the time it used to take to do that, we can send out like 50 emails in that time. we got these time-saving devices. In the time it used to take to walk to places and get things done, we can hop in the car now and go where we need to go and get back and use the time we save by catching up on Facebook and doing all these other things. We've got all these time-saving devices, but my fear is we're not saving any time. We're just filling our time with more stuff. And what if we slow down and clean out the clutter? In this day and age, I, I hear it all the time, I'm too busy. I'm too busy to do this or that. And I think like, like these hoarders that are shown on TLC, our lives are filled with this unhealthy amount of clutter and just waiting to be cleared out. And this is why I like watching the show, because I'm a neat freak. <laughs> I love at the end when they show the before and after scenes, where there used to be piles of stuff in every room. Now they show each room is cleared out and cleaned out, typically on every show. Not every show is like this, but they've cleaned out every room, and, and, and now there's, there's living space, and it's clean and healthy living space. Ephesians chapter 5 says this. Paul writes, he says, Be, be very careful, then, how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. We only have, we all have 24 hours in a day. None of us has more, none of us has less. We each get 24 hours in a day. And the question is, how are you investing your time? How are you spending your time in the time that God has given you? How, what are you doing with it? Eric Hoffer said it this way. He said, The feeling of being hurried is not usually the result of living a full life and having no no time. It is, on the contrary, born of a vague fear that we are wasting our life. When we do not do the one thing we ought to do, we have no time for anything else. We become the busiest and least contented people in the world. Ready to clean out the clutter? Let me give you the next one, and that's compromising. Compromising. Write that in your notes. Um, in Revelation, again, Jesus gives the church in Laodicea a huge warning. In chapter 3, he says this. Jesus says, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. And maybe, maybe some of us, you know, we don't want to be fanatics of Jesus. We don't want to be those weirdos, you know what I mean? We don't want to appear too intense about our faith, so we kind of back off a little bit. You know, we want, to, we, we want, to, we want people to know us as a, a down-to-earth person who likes to have a good time. Or we might not want to be that guy that cramps other people's styles, so we want to play it cool. And you might think that, that uh, it's okay to be naughty from time to time, and, and, and it won't matter. So I'm not hot and I'm not cold, I'm just lukewarm. And, and guess what Jesus wants to do? Your living this way makes Jesus sick. He wants to vomit you out of his mouth and be done. And what I'm talking about is, is church people 
who look like church people on Sunday mornings. And you guys all look great this morning, but it's, but it's these people that don't look like church people the rest of the time. You know what Jesus called these type of people? Yep, hypocrites. Hypocrites, play actors, masqueraders, people who just go through the motions because it's the right thing to do or the religious thing to do. Not authentic in their faith. They're just going through the motions. In other words, we just go through the motions and and Jesus doesn't have room in in anybody's life or any place in their life. And 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 he's just kind of shoved aside. There's a story about a group of about 20 Christians who are gathered together in secret for a Bible study in a village near Moscow. Some of you probably heard this story before. Uh, suddenly the door of the meeting room bursts open and two, two uh, communist soldiers rush in and they're wielding rifles with bayonets and they point them at this group of Christians. And one of the sh- soldiers shouts out, we, we want to be fair about this, so if, if you're really not into this Jesus thing, if, you're, if you really aren't committed to this Bible, if you don't really believe the Bible, we're going to give you a chance to leave. Get up and go now if that's you. If you don't really believe in Jesus Christ and you're not really into this, go ahead and leave. Well, all, all, about, all but about six of these 20 Christians got up and left the room for fear of their lives. They don't, they don't want to die. The soldiers went around the room and they locked the doors and they gave some time for the others to leave so they're not within earshot. And they, they turned and looked at the remaining Christians and they leaned their rifles up against the wall and the soldier said again, we're Christians too. We just couldn't take a chance. Let's study God's Word together now. How impactful is that? What would you do? Jesus said in Luke 9, 23, He said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. If your life, if you really depend on Jesus Christ, if he is number one in your life, is he, if he's the center of your life, what are you willing to give up? Will you deny saving face? Will you deny that next drink? Will you deny that moment of selfish pleasure? Or will you compromise everything you believe in and deny Jesus any room you might have left in your heart? Will you get up and leave the room when your life is on the line, when it comes to Jesus Christ? I can't help but think of the early Christians in uh, the first church who were brought into the public squares under the jurisdiction of Rome, and they were given the opportunity to deny Jesus Christ with their mouths. And, and if they didn't, or if they did deny Jesus, then their lives would be spared from maybe being burned alive or mold, being mauled by a lion or being hung upside down on a cross or being sawed in two, whatever crazy things they could think of and, and ways to get rid of these Christians. And they could have compromised. And they could have lived another day. But many of them denied their own selfish intuitions and they claimed Jesus as their Lord and Savior to their last breath. And they would say as they're dying, Once men catch a glimpse of the face of God, they refuse to bow to the image of man. Have you caught the face of God? Are you giving him some room this morning? Here's the last one. It's convenience. You could write comfort there as well. Convenience. I I hear people say from time to time, you know, I want our church worship service to be an hour, just one hour. I want to get in and get out, right? You know, I've got things to do. One hour, just give me one hour. Or I wish people, uh, preachers would stop talking about evangelism. Isn't our church big enough? Or I don't know how to talk to Jesus or talk to people about Jesus. You know, stop talking about evangelism. Make it convenient for me, Jeremy. Uh, I, I wish we'd stop singing those new songs. Daggone it, Jeremy, what are you trying to do to us? You know, so, so stop singing that. It's convenience. I want to sing the familiar stuff. Or why can't church be earlier in the morning? Why can't church be later in the day? Why can't it be Saturday night? You know, that'd be, why can't you fit church into my schedule? Convenience, convenience. Uh, a young man who was very much in love with a lady, he, would, he wrote a letter to her one day, and he was telling her all about how he loves her and he would do anything uh, to spend time with her. And, and he, so he, he writes to her and he says, I would endure the cold of the Arctic. I would cross the burning sands of the desert. I would climb the highest mountain and I would swim the deepest ocean to be in your presence. And then he closes the letter with these words, So I'll see you Wednesday night if it doesn't rain. 
Is that the type of Christians we are? We would do anything for Jesus, but man, if it interrupts my schedule, I don't know. Are we being Christians out of convenience? Galatians 6.9 says, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. You know, there's not a whole lot of convenience when it comes to Christianity. Some of you have lost friends because you became a Christian, because you are a Christian. Some of, some of us have had to clean up our lifestyles and get a little better. Some of us have had to rearrange our schedules so we could come to church or so we could be involved in ministry or we can lead a Bible study or attend a Bible study. Some of us have paid really deep costs to be a Christian. And it wasn't too convenient for Jesus either, if you think about it. Arrested, beaten, mocked, tried and crucified. Why? So we could live with him someday in heaven. Isn't that amazing? Jesus didn't go to the cross out of convenience. There's no way. And the good that Jesus carried out reaped this bountiful harvest. And the good that we continue to do, no matter what, day in and day out, if we continue to do good, even if it's not convenient, even if it's not convenient, we'll also reap a bountiful harvest. Something good will come of this, Jesus promises. For me, I think it comes down to identity. It's in Jesus that we find our identity. It's in Jesus that we find our identity. We don't get our identity at work. We don't really find our true identity in our divorce papers. Our our true identities aren't, aren't, aren't the diagnoses the doctors give us or your shrink gives you. That's not your identity. Your identity is that you are a child of God, and He loves you. When we find our identity in Jesus, we open the doors to every room in our hearts for Him. We clear out the clutter, we compromise for nothing, we compromise for no one, and we continue to do good even if it's not convenient. And just a warning, if you think you're giving just an hour or two on Sunday mornings satisfies Jesus? Mm -mm. Think again. He wants it all. He wants it all. Like the innkeeper, we're telling him, I'm sorry, but there's no room. That's what we're telling to Jesus. He wants it all. I like Zig Ziglar, a leadership guru and Uh, Here's what he writes concerning Christians. He says, I often hear the phrase, Sunday Christians. But the more I think about it, the more I am convinced these people do not exist. It is true that there are some who go to church on Sundays, dutifully carrying their Bibles, paying their stipend to the church, adjusting their halos, and rubbing their souls with the saints while planning to go back to the business community on Monday and prove how adept they are at manipulating people for their own personal gains. But I repeat, there is no such thing as a Sunday Christian. There are people who go to church on Sundays who say they're Christians, but when Christ takes over a life, it is a total makeover. Not just for one day of the week, or even two or three. This is not to say that Christians will live perfect, sinless lives, because they won't. But it does mean that when a Christian knowingly sins, God puts a burden within him or her that he cannot bear until he or she confesses and makes it right. Are you a Sunday Christian? Zig Ziglar says there's no such thing. You're either in or out. And I don't know about you, but I want to be found in at the end of time. There may be no room in the inn. My prayer is that we can say with slow Leroy Herdman, but you can stay in my room. 